good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all whenever you are, and welcome to the 2021 Fiscal Forum. This year, we are dedicating it to a topic that is going to grow in significance as we move forward with climate change and the urgency of a green recovery. Uh, my name is Kristalina Georgieva. For those who may not know me, I am the managing director of the IMF. And uh, I have the uh, privilege today to be joined by four ministers of finance who have a lot to say on this topic. And uh, in the uh, alphabetical order of your last names, uh, Minister Zainab Ahmed, Minister of Finance of Nigeria. Uh, Zainab, you can wave, although I think people know you. <laughs> uh, Minister Nigel Clark, Minister of Finance and Public Service of Jamaica. Welcome, uh, Nigel. Minister Daniele Franco, Minister of Economy and Finance of Italy. Brand new on the job, but not on the topic. And uh, Minister Sri Muliani Indrawati, uh, Minister of Finance of Indonesia. I think, uh, Sri Muliani, you are the doyen of this uh, uh, quartet in terms of years uh, on the job as Minister of Finance. Uh, we, uh, we are assembling uh, at a very critical time. We just uh, completed the uh, spring meetings of uh, the IMF and the World Bank and the high uh, light of the meeting uh, is the following message. The world economy is on a firmer footing, but we still face great uncertainty and significant risks. Uh, on the downside, mostly by the um, uh, evolution of the pandemic, but also fiscal space in different places capacity to act. On the upside, if we are successful as a global community to accelerate vaccinations, we may be able to accelerate the recovery as well. As we talk about coming fr from this crisis, it is inevitable to concentrate our at attention on the other crisis that is looming on the horizon and for some already present, and it is the climate crisis. It is very much connected to the mandate of the IMF. Why? Because climate shocks are increasing in frequency and uh, in significance. They affect macroeconomic and financial stability, but also more positively because climate action can generate growth and employment, and we need both coming out from this crisis. So what we would like to do today is to talk about the fiscal aspect of how we are going to generate a greener recovery and how we are going to take advantage of what is likely to be a significant structural transformation towards digital, low carbon, climate resilient, economy. So without any further ado, I'm going to open our discussion. And uh, the first question I want to ask uh, our participants uh, is how do they see the uh, multilateral environment in terms of putting a sound foundation for using fiscal measures, revenue generation, and, and spending to shift towards low carbon climate resilient future. Uh, and I will start with uh, uh, Daniele. Uh, you, you took a new job and with it, you took the helm of G20. And it was very impressive how much this issue of the transition to the, to the new climate economy was present at our G20 uh, meeting. What are your expectations and uh, what do you think in the end of the year you will be passing to Sri Muliani since Indonesia is the next chair of the G20? 
So uh, thank you, Kristalina. Uh, that's, uh, it's very good to be here today to discuss uh, this issue. I will try to illustrate uh, what uh, we are doing within the G20 uh, work. Uh, I think that over the last year, uh, policymakers have devoted their effort to the fight against the pandemic and the fight against the recession related to the pandemic. But the discussion on the future of uh, uh, climate change and the measure to fight against it uh, has not lost momentum. And this is clear uh, in the work of the G20. Uh, climate change is actually one of the priorities of uh, uh, the G20. 20 work this year. So we know that the pandemics and climate change are not unrelated. Uh, uh, the United Nations One Health approach has recognized that uh, human health is closely connected to the health of the planet. Uh, we also know that the pandemics and climate change share an important similarity. I mean, we know that no country is safe uh, till the virus circulates uh, around the world. As well, at the same time, no country is safe from climate change uh, till all countries have reduced emissions. So I think this is an important similarity to, to keep in mind. Uh, this implies that in both cases, international coordination is fundamental. And coordination is indeed being a key to tackling the health uh, crisis and the recession. And I think that the recently established and strengthened synergy should not be dissipated, but rather they should be strengthened in view of the climate issue. More specifically, in the recovery from the current crisis, it is important that the urgency to expand our economies to make them recover uh, does not undermine our efforts uh, to put the economy on a sustainable path. And this poses uh, relevant uh, changes uh, as the low carbon transition may be uneven and may penalize uh, some sector or technologies. There can be trade-offs between uh, economic growth uh, in the short term and the sustainability uh, in the medium term. So it is uh, therefore important that we carefully design a post-emergency stimulus measure in a way that uh, the two objectives can be achieved at the same time. So stimulus packages should not finance technologies that would lock in our economies into a fossil uh, fuel-based uh, future. And for this inter alia, we need uh, a coordinated effort to establish a common price uh, for carbon which uh, must be uh, progressively increased over time in order to reach the Paris uh, uh, goals. So this year, Italy is uh, acting on the front of the climate change uh, in two ways. Uh, first, uh, as chair of G20. Second, as co-chair of COP26 uh, with the UK, who, which is chairing uh, G7. So in this capacity, we are strongly committed to building uh, a consensus among the members of the G20 to reach uh, a concrete and ambitious results uh, for uh, COP26, uh, making this year a turning point in the fight against climate change. Uh, within the G20, we have mandated the Financial Stability Board to produce a report on sustainability disclosure and climate data gaps. We also asked uh, the IMF to include climate issue in setting up a new data gap initiative and together with OECD to prepare a report on the role of taxation in tackling climate change issue to be discussed uh, at the high level conference in July. This is uh, one of the link between the fiscal side and the climate side. And under our initiative, the G20 uh, has revived the Sustainable Finance Study Group. Uh, and we are very happy that the US and China has accepted our proposal to chair this group. Uh, the group has made rapid progress uh, in the last few weeks uh, and is focused on three areas, sustainability reporting, the metrics for clarifying and verifying investment sustainability, the way to enhance the contribution of international financial institutions to the Paris uh, Agreement goal. These different work themes will lead the way toward the Venice Climate Summit in next July, in which we will explore ways to scale up uh, dedicated finance support uh, uh, to the fight against uh, uh, climate uh, change. So, thank you. 
Raffaele. So uh, July 11th is the Venice Climate uh, Summit. Um, are we going to be there in person or we would be still in this virtual world? What is your prediction? I hope in person. I hope in person. Is uh, we will try as much uh, as we can to have uh, you all there in person. The, I think uh, this will be a great result per se. Uh, and I'm. Uh, I, I assume that uh, all of us, the uh, five on this call, we are invited. We'll be there. Um, let me let me let me move to uh, Sri Muliani. Uh, you uh, took a. Um, a additional responsibility on uh, your, as we have learned over the years, very strong shoulders. And it is to be the co-chair of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. Uh, as I mentioned, you're also going to be uh, the chair of G20 next year. How do you see ministers of finance coming together and what what do you see as being most pressing for this group, especially in the context of the conversation we, we have today, which is fiscal, fiscal measures? And what was your take of your, of, of your participation in the meeting? Okay, thank you, Kristalina. Well, first, when we talk about the climate, we know that this is a global problem. So no one country can solve it. So uh, multilateral and cooperation, global cooperation, as mentioned by Daniel, is, is becoming uh, the essential and necessary condition. The second one, uh, we have uh, an agreement in Paris, the UNFCCC and the COP16, in which country has already put the national determined uh, contribution. And uh, for a country who's already uh, make this uh, commitment, there is uh, another challenge, uh, Kristalina. Of course, with today, uh, COVID, uh, fiscal space has been uh, significantly eroded. So now the ability to deliver this national uh, determined contribution becoming also uh, need uh, to have a very critical uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, and then we know how to address uh, the climate, how whether we need to turn or transform the economy, right? Because from what you call it non-green to become green, from non-renewable becoming renewable. So the design of this transformation is becoming very critical. And this design usually uh, have a, facing a very important obstacle that is the price of this climate has not been recognized because this is considered uh, underpriced. And that's why the carbon pricing is still struggle to be established by many countries because there is no one unanimous agreement regarding this. What is actually the real price of uh, polluting uh, the earth? So. Uh, and we know that fiscal policy is very important. You're asking about the role of fiscal policy when you know there is a, a phenomena of public good. So we can internalize through policy or to the tax policy. That is the instrument which is very, very critical. You mentioned about the coalition uh, of uh, finance minister uh, for this climate uh, uh, change agenda. The coalition is very important uh, in achieving the Paris Agreement, especially through the fiscal and financial policies. These are very two very critical uh, instruments that is fiscal and financial because they can tilt the balance. They can definitely incentivize, providing the very powerful signal or incentive or disincentive. When we talk about fuel subsidies, these are all fiscal policy. When you are talking about carbon price or carbon tax, that's another uh, fiscal policy. Uh, another thing that can be on the financial side is how they are going to be able to then come up with the regulation that can reflect a better uh, really cost of this climate that can be put within the current risk framework, whether this is on the fiscal, monetary or on the financial side. I think that is the most important of this coalition. That is internalizing something which uh, envisages and, and will happen 
But at this very moment, maybe uh, many policymaker or even society uh, tend to be very myopic. They only look at the current situation, especially when you, we are also at the same time facing with this pandemic uh, challenge, which is also eroding uh, many of the uh, ability to survive at the corporate level, society, as well as government. So this is a very challenging task. That's why this coalition of the finance minister is very important and powerful. With now the membership, Kristalina is 60 countries, which is very good because uh, like United States, well, uh, we have another six new members, including United States uh, is now joining this coalition and also supported by international uh, financial institutions like IMF World Bank. So it's really a good a forum for us to exchange view, to understand what is the policy challenge, to even uh, understand the knowledge that can be transferred because climate change will require three, three things, uh, Kristalina. Financing, technology, and knowledge. I think uh, without these three, you can discuss, you can have so many COP 16, 17, 18, and all around, then you are not going to achieve a significant uh, result. So three is very critical, financing, technology, and uh, the, the uh, advice or knowledge uh, from uh, advanced country, from multilateral, to especially developing and emerging country. So with that, I think what we are aiming for the coalition of finance minister, we will be able to provide a platform for us to learn each other. It can also come up with the solution and then identify resources really needed in order for us to be able to deliver a credible commitment. Then with this resource, which is committed, then we will be able to then come up where and how we are going to be able to get this uh, solution. As the chair of the G20 next year, so I heard very carefully Daniel mention uh, at the current, I'm very, very hopeful because this is still very critical. So the continuation of the climate agenda within the G20 is very important. And I'm very glad to see that this is the case. I mean, along all those hosts, uh, as I, far as I can remember, the G20 first time met uh, after global financial crisis in 2009. Until today, I think the commitment on the climate is actually quite consistent. The question now, how we are going to be able to deliver in a more credible way. I think that is going to be the most important. So for me, personally, Kristalina, because Indonesia as a co-chair for this uh, climate coalition, uh, climate finance minister uh, coalition for uh, for financing and also for the G20 host next year. I think this is a two very important coincide that will reinforcing each other. And of course, the role of the multilateral is become one of the most important element because this is a global problem. No country can solve it alone. I, I so very much agree with you that uh, we all have to work uh, together uh, and uh, that uh, we are at a very critical junction. This next decade is uh, virtually going to decide the future of, uh, uh, of our children. Um, we have to be determined and uh, I like very much the way you put the three finance, technology, knowledge, uh, the, the, the uh, three key elements of us making uh, progress. And uh, Nigel, I, I, I would think that this is a good news for you to hear from large economies a determination to move forward for a, uh, for a country like Jamaica that has done very little to uh, contribute to uh, climate change, but is highly vulnerable to the consequences uh, uh, that sense of urgency must be quite uh, profound. Uh, and uh, my question to you is, for countries like Jamaica, what is it that you are hopeful to see coming from the international community this year, 2021, a very uh, critical year? And so when we are in November at COP26, what would give you confidence that the world is finally moving in the right direction? 
Uh, th no, thank you for that question, uh, Kristalina. I mean, COP26 is reputed to be the most significant uh, climate conference since COP21, and, and for good reason. And it is happening at a time where it is quite evident that the world's greatest problem can only be sustainably solved through uh, global solidarity and through coordinated and concerted uh, multilateral action. And that is no truer than with the problem of climate change. And so what we would be hoping to see coming out of COP26 is, uh, firstly, that, as uh, was mentioned earlier, that we resolve the remaining barriers towards a, a fluent and, and fluid and effective uh, carbon market. Without a carbon market where uh, the pricing is uh, agreed upon by, you know, in a multilateral fashion, we won't be able to, or the world or, or nations of the world uh, won't be incentivized towards the kinds of decisions that are necessary for us to resolve this, uh, this, this crisis. And the saying is that while we fiddle, uh, Rome burns. In this case, uh, the Rome in this uh, example is uh, the developing world, where the uh, and and the world uh, you know closer to the equator, where the risks of climate change and the impact of climate change is most uh, felt and with disastrous impact. The second thing that we will be looking forward to see uh, coming out of COP twenty six is the a multilateral move towards a greater definition, uh, a clearer roadmap, and a more comprehensive commitment towards the goal of over $100 billion of uh, investment or the mobilization of that on an annual basis for climate-related investment and for green investment in the developing world. Uh, the climate agenda, in order to uh, meet the requirements for adaptation and for mitigation, uh, is an expensive agenda. It's an agenda that requires uh, billions and billions of dollars of investment. And this has been spoken about for some time, but the move towards uh, action has been slow. And what we would want to be seeing out of COP26 is a, a greater and concerted effort towards action as far as mobilizing investment for uh, the climate change agenda uh, throughout the developing world. So I'd say those are the two concrete, uh, the concrete developments that we've been looking forward to, you know, in COP26 or from 26. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. So you, you, you are stressing, uh, we need to have carbon price and carbon markets. We need to have a um, significant transfer of financial resources uh, to countries that are on their own with very limited fiscal space, uh, not able to catch up. Uh, that, that echoes um, uh, what Sri Muliani said, um, uh, especially on the financing uh, side. Uh, we are now at a point when finally there is more traction on putting a price on carbon in a differentiated manner. Clearly, different countries at different stages of development have to uh, apply that price uh, according to their uh, capacity to bear a price. Uh, but there is progress. Um, last year, 20, 2020, saw a uh, quite market, marketed, marketed increase in carbon uh, coverage of carbon price uh, from 17% of carbon emissions to 23% of carbon emissions. One can say 23 is very far from 100, but uh, it looks like the, train, the trend is going uh, in the right uh, direction. Uh, and yet we need to recognize that uh, uh, 
for different uh, levels of income, this is a very different proposition. And I want to bring now in the conversation, Zainab. Uh, uh, Zainab, you have done something very great in Nigeria. Uh, again, linking to Sri Muliani's point about the role of finance authorities in um, eliminating uh, harmful subsidies, you have taken uh, a step towards cutting fossil fuel uh, subsidies so we can have a more uh, inclusive price of uh, energy on that basis. I can imagine this has not been easy. And uh, what I would like us to share with the uh, audience is how, you, how Nigeria came uh, to take this step. What were the, uh, some of the uh, complexities you had to overcome? Uh, what are the lessons uh, you can draw for other countries? Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Crystalina, for inviting me to join this conversation and also for the urgent uh, prioritization of climate change issues. We were concerned that amidst the pandemic and the challenges it posed to us that climate change issues will be not be getting enough attention. So we're glad that this is uh, not, not, not the case. Um, in Nigeria, we have had to take a number of very difficult measures, but I must say that the pandemic itself produced for us the perfect opportunity to take advantage, uh, which we took advantage of very, very quickly to remove fuel subsidies and also to move electricity tariff to market reflective tariff. It was not, uh, so at the beginning, it was kind of easy because the fuel price, uh, uh, the crude oil uh, price in the international market was very, very low. And therefore, uh, we now had an opportunity to, by removing the subsidy, we even had the opportunity to crash the price down. But of course, when the price began to recover, and because we had moved to a market reflective tariff, the, the tariff continued to adjust upwards. So now we are actually negotiating with labor. They're beginning to say that the price is going up too high. So we're working now to find um, ways to provide some circa and palliatives in the form of maybe transport allowances. Uh, but we're insisting that the fuel subsidy stays. And the same challenge also we have with the electricity subsidy. We have had uh, for a long time been subsidizing electricity tariff. Now we have allowed it to be market reflective. So there's uh, tariff bands that we have created and you can choose your tariff band if you want uh, 12 hours of power, there's a, a tariff if you want 18, if you want 24 hours. So you actually choose your uh, tariff band. A lot of resistance, but we still are standing on those. And instead, what we're looking at is how do we provide some cushion? And we made sure that the tariff for the, the what we call the land tariff for the very poor and vulnerable, that is people that have maybe just a bulb or two in their house that it didn't change. And um, so we continue to push this on a daily basis. It's, it's very difficult, but the, we're standing firm on this. The benefit for us is that we're saving so much money when we told public that the amount of money we're saving is almost one and a half times the budgets for health and education then people understood how large these subsidies are so now we freed those resources and it helped us to uh, uh, respond better to the uh, health and the economic uh, challenge, challenge um, itself and we're continuing to find more ways to uh, make sure that this is not just a, uh, to show that this is not just a cost saving measure, but it's also saving the environment. It's helping us to meet our national determined in, uh, indicators, helping to contribute to the global commitments for climate change. But I want to resonate what Nigel said. I do hope that the developing countries that have made a commitment to, con to, to mobilize funding up to 100 billion to help us globally to move towards uh, 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 climate uh, resistant energy that these funds are, do, are, are mobilizing. So it's, quite, it's, it's quite expensive. We're trying to attract investors to come into our countries to set up uh, production plants that will produce solar panels. Uh, but it's, it's, it's work in progress. So what we've done now is we have, we have uh, allowed uh, mobile small sets of uh, what we call home uh, panels 
So you buy a panel that you can actually lift it. It's in your house. You have light. You have uh, some air cooling. And people, it's become very popular. So people are not having to worry about electricity because they, are, they have their own, their own power. Thank you, Crystalini. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very interesting to listen to you. And so let me uh, uh, completely support that notion that when uh, one eliminates harmful subsidies, it doesn't mean hurting vulnerable people if the policies are designed properly. Uh, you also brought up the uh, accessibility and affordability of solar power that has become so as a result of uh, technology transfer and then putting it on scale. But to be on scale, there has to be investment on scale. Uh, and that I think is uh, uh, crucial for us to remember. Uh, and again, you hammered the message, the 100 billion is a pledge made. It has to be honored for the, the benefit of everyone. Uh, it is in a way similar to what we face with vaccinations. We have to vaccinate everyone everywhere mm -hmm. for the benefit of all. Very similar uh, with the action on climate. Uh, let, me, let me move a little bit uh, deeper on this question of uh, uh, pricing carbon. Uh, our research at the fund is very clear. Without uh, putting a price on carbon, it would be very difficult to create the incentive to move the world towards the Paris Agreement. And therefore, it is paramount to be successful in that regard. Uh, Daniele, one of the concerns countries have, those that have been advanced in putting a price on carbon faster, is that they may lose competitiveness with industries moving to places where the carbon price is uh, lower or non-existent. Uh, in the EU, this uh, concern has uh, led to very intensive discussions on a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism. Uh, can you please talk about it a little bit? It has been uh, a source of some anxiety in many, especially in many developing countries. Uh, is there a way to put a price of carbon as a floor? and then avoid, accelerate carbon pricing everywhere and avoid this uh, uh, mechanism that we at the fund think uh, is the second best, not the first best. So can you, can you tell us a bit more about it? And uh, uh, then uh, if uh, the other three speakers want to react, of course, you're welcome to step in. Daniele. No, thank you, Kristalina. You're pointing at uh, two related, very important issues. One is the impact uh, of uh, carbon pricing on competitiveness. Uh, the other is uh, the issue of uh, <clears throat> cooperation. And I think both are very much important in, uh, in the success uh, of uh, carbon pricing policies. Uh, let me... <coughs> summarize what the European Union is doing. As you know, the European Union is uh, uh, targeting a reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emission by 55% uh, by 2030 in comparison to uh, 1919 uh, levels. And to achieve uh, uh, this target, uh, the European Commission is expected to present in June 2021 a package of measures that uh, will include uh, the revision of the Energy uh, Taxation Directive, the revision and extension of the emission trading system, complemented with the introduction of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. The adoption of the first two initiatives will generate in Europe in the next few years an increase in the price of emissions from the current level. So uh, should uh, uh, the increase in the price of carbon in Europe be larger than elsewhere, there is a risk uh, of uh, the so-called carbon leakage. Uh, a, a higher carbon price uh, in Europe may induce substitution of European products uh, with non-European, uh, uh, more carbon intensive and uh, uh, less expensive products. At the same time, uh, it may induce the delocalization of uh, European production to other countries. So addressing uh, the risk of uh, carbon leakage is therefore very much important. Uh, 
if not properly managed, uh, this uh, would undermine the effectiveness of the European efforts uh, towards uh, towards uh, curbing, uh, curbing uh, global emissions, since uh, it would just uh, shift uh, higher emissions uh, elsewhere. Against this background, the Commission intends to complement the new uh, emission trading system with, uh, as I said, a carbon border adjustment mechanism aimed at ensuring that the price of imports into the European Union reflects uh, more accurately their carbon content. Uh, let me recall that the mechanism will be designed in compliance with the WTO rules uh, and with the other international obligation of the European Union. Therefore, the carbon price of important goods uh, will be equalized uh, to that of goods uh, produced uh, in the European Union, ensuring a level playing field uh, uh, among European and non-European uh, producers. The introduction of such a mechanism may obviously uh, raise uh, concerns uh, on the impact uh, uh, in other countries, so let me add some considerations about that. First, uh, the introduction of the mechanism will be gradual, initially covering only a limited set of commodities. Uh, this will contribute to dilute uh, the, its impact to other countries uh, and on international trade. Second, the mechanism will also operate as a positive incentive uh, as EU trading partners will be encouraged to enhance their climate risk mitigation efforts uh, in the framework of the Paris Climate Agreement. Third, we are well aware that the less developed countries may be less equipped uh, to promote a transition towards uh, uh, greener technologies and production. So to address uh, this issue, the introduction of the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism will be complemented by EU initiatives aimed at uh, supporting uh, these countries in their investment on sustainable energy. Um, the existing technical assistance program will certainly be further enhanced uh, uh, for countries that intend to reduce their carbon footprints. Uh, coming to the second issue on the link uh, with international coordination, I think the, the issue depends very much on the time horizon that we consider. Uh, we will realistically achieve the common objective of a net zero emission by 2050 with different speed. And, and different trajectories, that's clear. Uh, in the medium term, the best way to address effectively and consistently the challenges of climate change is through, again, a constructive international dialogue and cooperation. Of course, an agreement on carbon or setting a carbon floor among large emitters will be a decisive, a decisive uh, step toward decarbonization as it would obviously reduce uh, uh, significantly uh, global emission, it could also be uh, a game changer to move uh, uh, international coordination. However, as long as the agreement on a carbon floor, price floor is not global, there will still be a merit in having mechanisms in place that provide appropriate incentives for countries outside the agreement to enhance their climate mitigation effort and possibly enter into the agreement. Uh, as I said before, a properly designed carbon border adjustment mechanism would be able to do precisely uh, that. Uh, and it could as well coexist uh, with a carbon price floor agreement among large emitters. Uh, thank you, Daniele. Uh, very clear. And uh, if I were to draw one conclusion, it is the faster we move towards uh, uh, carbon pricing in a differentiated but appropriate manner, the better it would be uh, for all, uh, all of us. Uh, we talked uh, um, primarily about mitigation so far, and uh, uh, I want to give proper attention to the other two very important aspects of climate action, adaptation and transition. And we have the perfect, perfect uh, panelists for that. So I, first I would turn to Nigel uh, and ask you, what, what does it mean for a Minister of Finance of highly vulnerable country that has been hit time and again uh, by climate-related natural disasters 
uh, to build resilience to these shocks. What have you learned? What do you want from the uh, international community in support? Hi, Crisolino. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. The adapting uh, fiscal policies to to climate change, uh, you know, requires us to climate proof uh, public investment and to ensure that we channel resources in the areas that can improve our own resilience to uh, climate shocks through investing in uh, uh, things like uh, So investing in uh, drainage and the rerouting of roads and energy efficient uh, solutions. Uh, Jamaica is pursuing, you know, a policy that focuses on adaptation and mitigation, but also on dealing with the fiscal costs of uh, climate change and the fiscal costs of natural disaster. We are. Uh, we are moving towards a, a multi-layer strategy for managing the fiscal costs of natural disaster that involves uh, fiscal transfers on an annual basis as one layer, another layer being a natural disaster uh, fund, even with limited fiscal space that we hope to capitalize over time, uh, and then a variety of risk transfer instruments that include uh, credit contingent uh, products, uh, risk transfer instruments, including parametric insurance, as well as a catastrophe bond. You know, each year, the effect of climate change has a, a fiscal impact on the budgets of vulnerable countries. And in many ways, you can look at some portion of the accumulation in debt is as a result of the action that has been absolutely necessary each and every year in order to respond to the rehabilitation costs that come from natural disaster events that are routine. And so what Jamaica is moving to do is to recognize this cost ex ante and to implement solutions that can deliver fiscal resources if and when, as we expect, these events materialize over time. We are doing that on our own. Now, as far as the international community is concerned, we believe that now more than ever, it should be evident that you know, countries uh, in, you know, closer to the equator, uh, in regions such as ours, regions in the Pacific, and other parts of the world uh, face you know, triple vulnerability. Uh, there is the vulnerability that comes from, you know, high debt accumulated, uh, as I mentioned, in part, in part, uh, due to responses to climate action in years that preceded now or decades that preceded now. And that debt limits uh, fiscal space. But there's also the vulnerability that arises from the climate change and the risks of natural disaster, which ironically increases fiscal costs, it increases the riskiness of economy, and both of those contribute to uh, muted economic growth. And then if that were not enough, we now face the vulnerability brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic and the, the scarcity of, of, of vaccinations. And those, that triple vulnerability puts uh, countries uh, in our part of the world in a very, uh, you know, challenging position. Now, what can the, the international, so what we are doing, as I mentioned, is fiscal cost of natural disaster. We're, we'll be, you know, having a multi-layer strategy, adapting fiscal policy with public investment that, you know, is climate uh, aware and that climate proofs our economy, as well as tax policy reviewing uh, approaches to the taxation of, uh, of vehicles, for example, the possibility of electric vehicles 
receiving much more favorable treatment. As far as the international community is concerned, uh, as I, we mentioned earlier, and as I think has been uh, repeated even in the session, you know, action towards that, uh, the commitment of uh, investment in the developing world to the tune of over $100 billion annually uh, in public investment and other projects in ways that are measurable and that are new and additional and not part of uh, you know, aid budgets. Here we're talking about investment. Uh, the second is, uh, I believe there is a, a renewed opportunity, uh, and not necessarily speaking on behalf of Jamaica, but speaking on behalf of the developing world as a group uh, for, you know, debt for climate change swaps, uh, where countries make certain commitments towards uh, climate proof in their economies, which requires fiscal space and fiscal resources. And in return, uh, through various mechanisms, we can have uh, swaps of debt. Now, clearly, that uh, doesn't work as well if, if debt is in the you know, predominantly in the private sector. But for countries where debt is predominantly you know, of the official variety, there's a huge opportunity uh, for debt for climate change swaps. And then the third thing I would say is uh, finding ways to participate in the risk transfer instruments that are being pioneered. Uh, you know, multilaterally, bilaterally, uh, there's a lot of scope for that. Jamaica in sort of pioneered in the catastrophe bond that we hope to launch later this year with the assistance of the World Bank. Uh, we, you know, the premium or the premium for that catastrophe bond, uh, we, you know, had the participation of the, of the GRIF facility, which the UK and the Germany are a part of, uh, as well as the governments of Canada and the United States you know, have played uh, a key role uh, in that. And, and that's a concrete example of how uh, the international community can get involved. So just to repeat uh, in, in summary, what we are doing on our own is uh, to adapt fiscal policy uh, to ensure that public investment is, is greener and public investment climate proofs our economy. Looking at our tax policy, to ensure we can incentivize the right kind of investments. And thirdly, uh, in our region at least, uh, pioneering uh, a multi-layer strategies to manage the fiscal cost of natural disaster with risk transfer instruments. And what the international community can do uh, to bolster the efforts that we're making on our own uh, include one, you know, action towards that $100 billion commitment into the developing world for investment. The second, is uh, participation in uh, or, or innovation along the lines of the debt for climate change swaps and the various ideas that have been around for a couple of years about how that can advance agenda. And the third uh, would be participation in risk transfer instruments that can that come after mitigation, that come after adaptation. The natural disasters, in some ways, you know, uh, a lot of the climate risk has been baked in, even though there is definitely room uh, for us to avert the worst. And so we're going to have natural disasters. And so after adaptation and mitigation, uh, investing in instruments that can allow vulnerable countries to absorb the fiscal costs of natural disasters when they occur. Thank you very much, Kristalina. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, and I agree we need to think uh, creatively. We are faced with problems of very different magnitude. Uh, and we have to find solutions to these problems uh, uh, together. And actually, the World Bank and IMF are working on these innovations. And the, I believe the Venice uh, uh, conference, climate conference, is going to be a good place prior to uh, COP26 to see which of these ideas may, may be uh, advanced. Uh, when we talk about transition, there are many countries that find themselves at the place where they do need to think about diversification. What does it mean a transition to low carbon economy if fossil fuels are a big part of your uh, income generation? And I know that uh, uh, Nigeria is wrestling with this, with this question. Uh, Zainab, you recently issued the first in Africa green bond. How do you think about diversification and are green bonds uh, something that uh, you see as uh, an investment avenue, uh, Nigel, and both Nigel and Sri Muliani talked about uh, the importance of uh, uh, supporting green investment. So how do you see 
your transition and what role can uh, green finance uh, uh, play in it? Well, thank you very much, uh, Kathalina. Let me just uh, restate some of the things that have been earlier said that some of our countries, like in South of Africa, actually remain low emitters to the world greenhouse uh, effect. And uh, also, we have unfortunately have had to suffer frequent catastrophic in, uh, uh, incidents over, over the years. And these incidents further amplify the macro relevance of climate change stemming from unbudgeted spending on infrastructure, rehabilitation, food imports, disruptive trade, and so many other fiscal imbalances that such disruptions uh, bring. So we're just uh, for short exposed to financial vulnerabilities. So we found the opportunity to raise funds for green projects using the green bonds. And Nigeria's green bond has been very popular within the country and also within the region. The market took up these bonds and made a demand for more than we had set out to do. And this has happened three years running. So we, we presenting these green bonds, projects that are already within our national budget, but that are green projects. And uh, so it was a surprise to us that there are investors that actually are looking for opportunities to invest in such projects so solar power projects hydro projects and so many other projects that are friendly to the environment and the interest is not just in providing the financing but also in tracking the performance of the projects as they are uh, as they are committed so we continue to issue these bonds on an annual uh, basis it has become one of the tools to finance our, our, our budget and we'll continue to do more because not only because it raises finance, but because it makes sense and it's good for the environment and it's climate friendly and it's helping us meet uh, nationally determined indicators contributing to uh, the global goals that we all are committed to. I do hope that um, uh, in while we're considering this, we should, uh, especially at COP26, that we should consider the cost of adaptation, which is not cheap. Uh, within a circumstance when uh, resources are, are scarce. So we need to consider what is the cost of adaptation for countries like our countries? What does it mean uh, to us? And also uh, we need to look at how we can give our countries a slack to select some energy types, especially gas, and classify them as transition energy. For Nigeria, uh, we are actually a gas nation, not an oil uh, nation, we have maybe about the third or fourth largest deposits of gas uh, today in the world, yet we have not explored it. We want to explore gas to be able to help fast track development within the economy. So it's not for export, it's for driving industrialization. And we do hope at COP26 that Kristalina and your colleagues will help us to have gas classified as a transition energy. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank very, a very useful. Uh, comments, uh, uh, they are the uh, pathways to building uh, a uh, global action on climate in a timely manner. Uh, Sri Muliani, uh, I want to ask the last question in this session to you because you are one of the leading voices for green budgeting. And obviously how budgets are constructed matters. Uh, could you could you tell us a little bit on how how you track green in the budget and why you are a proponent of green budgeting? Thank you, Kristalina. First, uh, I think it's come from the commitment at the global level for you to have this national determinist uh, determined uh, commitment. And in order for you to be able to deliver that, then you really need to establish a mechanism, a platform within your own country, whether this is going to be translated into the uh, planning and then budgeting and then execution. Now within our budget, then we start to identify what is the portion of the budget which is dedicated for the climate since 2016, we allocate the climate budget uh, around 4.5 4.1% uh, per year or around 6.2 billion per year. 
This is only 34% from the total mitigation uh, fund. How we establish that? Of course, we uh, get the knowledge uh, support, technical support also from World Bank in this case, in order for us to be able to identify and how to tag the budget which is related to the climate. I think with this climate budget tagging, we were we are we were able to build uh, the reputation for the fiscal policy, transparency, as well as commitment and consistency related to the climate change agenda. With that kind of reputation we just established, it is easier for us when we are issuing the green uh, uh, financing, especially with the global bonds, uh, as well as domestic retail bonds, because when you have the green bonds, then you have to be able to prove that it is really for a green project. And in order for you to be able to support that, that will, uh, you definitely need to establish this kind of mechanism. So that is actually linked for us to be able to then do the budget tagging or MDC, translate it into planning, budgeting, execution, and then do the climate budgeting, budget tagging. Then it then can derive the financing that is needed for us to address the issue of whether this is on a mitigation or even adaptation, as Nigel mentioned earlier. I want to just mention also, uh, as I said in many forums before, that when we issue the green bonds uh, globally, as uh, well as we also discussed earlier about the carbon price, uh, Kristalina, the price is not yet reflecting uh, the risk as well as the benefit of this kind of financing. So again, I think if we are all knows very well, if the market not properly priced, then the market fail. When the market fail, they cannot deliver what we want. And this is what Daniela mentioned uh, on the, U uh, the European effort to establish this carbon uh, emission trading system, addressing the carbon leakage and how you are going to be able to establish a certain mar market mechanism with a certain pricing that reflect the true value of carbon emission. I think that's going to be the most important fundamental thing if we, we want to use the market mechanism to solve this climate change. And definitely, I think market is very powerful, but when the market fail, then you cannot use this market as a useful tool to solve the problem. So a lot of uh, work need to be done uh, in order for us to be able to first build our own credibility mechanism and capacity is also important, Kristalina. Uh, uh, I am uh, actually very glad uh, as well as support on your commitment, for example, on the IMF work on this. If it is going to be also uh, putting within the Article 4, uh, then we are going to be able for each country to know where our position on climate, of course, I want to be very careful when you are using this uh, multilateral uh, uh, surveillance that should be also fair because each country have a totally different starting point and capacity. So if you are going to start using this multilateral surveillance, it should be in a package with capacity building as well as, uh, uh, of course, financing, as I mentioned earlier because that's what many people need, especially when we are dealing with many younger demographic uh, society that is population, they are more and more aware and they are also more concerned because it is really their future. So for them, they really want to participate. I think their lifestyle mindset and uh, their choice of consumption of how to invest is really reflecting this kind of growing concern from the especially younger generation. So for us to be able to then tap this opportunity, then we need to institutionalize and putting within the system, like in the fiscal side, whether on a taxation, whether this is on a subsidy, whether this is on an incentive, tax holiday, tax allowance. Okay, so then with this kind of uh, all instrument, we will be able we will be able to institutionalize and make it more uh, firm and and uh, credible 
of this kind of concern of the younger generation into real policy making process, instrument, then execution. I think this is what is the most critical on the fiscal authority side. That is the role of Minister of Finance is so, so important. A Minister of Finance can signal, uh, can initiate, can also provide the information, accountability, and also establish a credible track record for the policy uh, of each country that is following this commitment, which is not easy because commitment also uh, require uh, many different, uh, what you call it, one government uh, period. In Indonesia, of course, because we are open democratic, that is uh, beyond one country presidential term, the climate change need to be continued, right? So this is also another challenge, another political uh, side, uh, as we can see also in the United States, uh, States recently. So these are all uh, the fact that we are, uh, we are need to addressing uh, the issue. One last thing, Kristalina. If I look at this 100 billion that we mentioned earlier and by all of us, uh, on the one hand, if you look at the COVID, at this moment, uh, the IMF also measuring or the G20 tracking, there are 11 trillion US dollars to combat this pandemic. 11 trillion. Uh, so if you talk about 100 billion, it's very small actually. But we can be forced by this pandemic only within one year, all country committed to do the measure that cost us 11 trillion, only less than one and a half years. So when we talk a lot about 100 billion, knowing that this 11 trillion has been realized, I think we should be able to come up with something more credible action in order for us to be able to deliver this 11, uh, 100 billion, as Nigel mentioned uh, and Zainab mentioned, I think that's very, very important because country can commit and do, but uh, the credibility of global commitment will be eroded very significantly if we cannot deliver those. And I, I think that is that is uh, a lot, a huge possibility knowing that we can do that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, when you were speaking, I was looking at the uh, uh, other three ministers, and I think you summed it up what the role of fin finance minister is. Uh, we are on how important it is to signal a direction to travel, and I very much agree with the uh, credibility of the international community and the importance of trust so we can turn around uh, the uh, fate of our planet, and that is the fate of human civilization. Uh, I'm going to finish with a very clear takeaway message from you to the IMF. We have a responsibility to integrate climate action and climate risks in Article 4 and in financial sector assessments, because if climate risks are under stated they will be underfunded in terms of how we uh, address them. Uh, we also uh, take to heart the importance of data. Good data leads to good policies and we will wholeheartedly pursue the uh, new gate, uh, data gap initiative. And last but not least, capacity development. Uh, as uh, Sri said, finance, technology, knowledge. We have very deep knowledge on fiscal affairs. We owe it to our membership to integrate climate uh, uh, risks and uh, the uh, mitigation, adaptation and transition in the way we work. Uh, when I started in my job, uh, people told me IMF stands for it is mostly fiscal. And I think it is the right place to <laughs> wrap up the discussion today. We take this, uh, uh, the wisdom you shared with us to heart. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, great uh, uh, panel, fantastic insights. Thank you. Thank you, Kristalina. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Sri Mulyani. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.